Okay. So welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you're thinking through questions. Um, one of the things I'll drop in the chat, because this was mentioned yesterday, people say I'm hard to get a hold of. Actually, um, I'm very easy to get a hold of. You just need to reach out and connect to me. Um, and I'll drop these here with, um, you know, connect me on LinkedIn. I got Medium article. I got the YouTube channel. And the other one is WhatsApp and Signal is my cell phone number, which is some people say, why well, you got the cell phone number out there? But uh, 69. So this is the for WhatsApp and Signal. You can connect up on that, those two. Those are the ones I kind of watch all the time. So if you run into a situation where you're saying like, I need help with uh, figure out a DDoS situation or network sort of thing, or I'm trying to get my bosses to listen to me, or, hey, Barry, you know, in your slide archive, do you have something that's things like this? Uh, you ask. Again, the peer network is the powerful network, and, you know, uh, we, we, um, we grow together. So it's, it's uh, this is kind of like the approach, uh, those of us who've been around, how we maintain our, our edge as we invest in you know the new talent coming up we turn them and empower them push them up and then you know two years later we're coming to them coming to you guys and you know and say hey i need your help <laughs> so it goes back both directions uh and that's just kind of how the uh the, the uh internet has been built is with that sort of approach and we continue with that so um go ahead and do that um it's amazing how many people have reached out to me over the years with it. So feel free. Um, so, all right. So sectors validation. You hear this thing, you hear this all the time, BCP38. We only got more people do BCP38. Now, over and over and over again. So let's talk a bit about that to make sure everybody's clear about what we can do and what tools we have and what are the limitations and why it's not the answer to DDoS. And some people say, if only people could do, but there are limitations with it. And let's talk through it. So first guiding principle, BCP 38, right out of the RFC, your customers should not be sending any IP address out to the internet with a source address other than the address you have allocated to them. So BCP 38, versus source address validation. BCP 38 was specific between the ISP and the customer, right? So it's that edge of the network. Source address validation is broader. Like source address validation, I work at Akamai and we have edge regions, regions which is a stack of servers. We have them spread all over the planet. And we make sure we have source address validation set up on our regions just in case something happened and we're spoofing out, you know, we prevent the spoofs, right? Cloud operators should be doing source address validation. A service provider, service provider should be doing source address validation. So source address validation is multiple edges. BCP 38 is just that ISP customer edge. So what we need to do to stop the DOS attack is source address validation. We gotta do it everywhere. Everywhere there's an edge, everywhere there's a policy control where we can do it. Right, the RFC for this, the original RFC, um, is RFC um, uh, twenty eight twenty seven. Um, Paul Ferguson and Daniel Sine were the ones who kind of crafted up. They took the point and writing up the work with it. But it was a collective effort. There's a whole bunch of people that work behind it. And again, what we're doing here is it's blocking on between your customer side and you as ISP. Now, over the years, we need to come up with tools to make it easy for that. So it started with Access List. Then um, Unicast RPF Strict Mode was created. And Strict Mode kind of looks at the, the, the FIB and the ARP address, the MAC address, and puts them together and says, this interface, this IP address is allocated to this particular interface. And um, then you're able to do the checks. Uh, before that, you can do AAA. AAA allows you to download an Access List. So if you put AAA on there, and that was actually designed for modem systems. Um, then in DOCSIS, we have cable source verify for DOCSIS. So if you're running like on Comcast, Comcast does source address validation with 
cable source of oriferi, which is part of the DOCSIS specification. Then the packet cable multimedia, which was on um, um, you know, fixed line fiber systems, you know, um, and before that DSL systems, that's where the uh, P P M PCMM was deployed and the cable source verify, right? So there's a bunch of different techniques that when you talk to the vendors and the deployment with it to go out there. What's interesting is we got organizations that go and start doing the edge, putting CPEs out, they have the, 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 the head and equipment, whether it's a fiber or a cable system, and then they don't, the service provider doesn't bother to turn on, you know, the source validation. And then they run into problems, you know, especially with the CPEs get infected and the miscreants saying, hey, this is great. I can use these broken into CPEs because the passwords are so weak in a CPE and I can break into it and put my own code in. And now I have these nice, you know, hundreds and thousands of devices on a operator's network that I can use for a DOS attack, All right? So this is where, it's really important to, to do this um, approach. Um, so there's, again, there's many different working techniques out there. And, um, you know, you work with the, uh, your vendors to actually figure out which one are out there. Um, but then some people would say it's hard to deploy. Yes, it's, it's, well, I wouldn't say it's hard. It's tedious to deploy. You do have to deploy. It. Well, if any configuration you roll out across your network, this is no different. If you got to roll out a new configuration across your network, you got to follow certain procedures to make sure it's going to be, uh, you have operational confidence in the equipment and the functionality and the features. And that's the key thing, this term here, operational confidence. So when you run your test, when you run your uh, proof of concept, when you run your lab work, all, all of it is around getting operational confidence so you know that I can start rolling it out and it's not going to cause um, unexpected damage to my network. So let's take a, a scenario that was done with one of the big um, uh, backbones back in 2002. So 2002, um, we said, okay, let's put the point source address validation on the edge of the network. So, and I was at Cisco at the time, right? And it was at Cisco equipment. So month one, we did um, testing in the vendor's lab. In this case, it was Cisco, right? And we ran up the test. We were using unicast RPF and we set up all the, you know, performance test and make sure everybody's happy with it. And here's the packet per second. Here's the performance envelope. Remember I said in the last session, we say, here's a performance envelope. So when we turn this on, this is what you can expect. All right. And then we went and took one router and says, here's one port on one router. We turned it on with uh, a 16 by uh, OC3 connection. Right. And then, you know, we tested it out, ran it for a month. Everybody's happy operational confidence. Then we took the entire line card. So every, all 16 interfaces on the line card, all right? Ran that for a month. Then the next month we took every line card on the router. <laughs> okay, good. Then we took next month, every router in the pop. So we had like six or seven routers in the, in the particular pop, right? Okay, then everybody's good with it. All right, then we did a few more pops. All right, so not everything. And then by month seven, it's like, okay, this is standard. All new circuits will be doing this and here's the migration plan. So they went router by router by router, migrated every single router, this became standard configuration. It was upgraded and became a standard stuff. So you saw seven months. And that's, that's a conservative build confidence as you roll something out. And so, um, you know, and this is back 2002, Standard rollout plan. You talk to you know many of you should be op, uh, familiar with these sort of like conservative models of gain and operational confidence with it, and you can deploy it. You can get get out there. So the lessons you learn with this is it took time and patience. It it, it didn't work for all the customers, right? So some of the customers, Unicast RPF, you know, didn't work, and so they went to ACLs instead, right? It was and those exception cases were documented and says if you if you, it, and it became a, a procedural book. If this happened, then do this, right? So if this happened, don't use RPF, uh, use ACLs instead, right? And you know it's like you know within a year they had like you know forty thousand ports and then more and more and became you know standard with the operators and that's how a lot of operators, big operators, that's how they deployed it and had it had it work. Right, so you can't 
you know, excuse and say, oh, it's hard because what I just described wasn't hard. It's just very methodical. It's tedious, it's methodical, it get done. And you get a lot of success rate. But then you run into this 80% issue that you can get 80% of your network using the automated tools and you can get 80% doing source address validation, but then you run into like the 20% that you can't. And that's where our problem comes in there. So this, this gets into hard realities of what source address validation is. Um, so how long have we been running into this problem? All right, so let's apricot history, 1996. <laughs> I did a security class, a security tutorial in 1996. Got that apricot one, right? This was my agenda. Now look at this agenda, kind of think through this agenda. This is 1996 apricot, talking about BGP prefix filtering, source address validation, open ports that shouldn't be open, reflection attacks, DOS attacks, Advanced persistent threats. We didn't call it APT at the time, but we called you know people getting into your network, patching your system, monitoring. That's the telemetry. So let's think about this. 1996. You know, some of you on this call, you know, were probably in grade school, you know, in, in that right. So this is this is how long we've been hitting these points over and over and over again. If we were talking about source address validation in 1996, and here we are in 2022, and we're talking about the same problem, we have to think about some of the things we're doing here, right? Is it, is it, um, is it you know, this whole traditional advocacy about the source address validation, you know, we just keep on saying, do this, do this, do this, but if we've been advocating it since 96, hmm, is the ladder on the wrong wall? Are we really thinking through this properly, right? Um, because when you get to the 20% point, if I can get 80% of the internet doing source address validation and I got the 20%, it's an 80-20 problem. That last 20% is gonna be hard. 80% is easy, 20% is hard, right? And this is where we kind of go through and say, if you keep on the, sitting the same thing, I like, I like this Stephen Covey sort of approach. If we keep on, you know, if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster, right? And one of the things I, I get hammered with because I'm a critic about keep on insisting on BCP38 because it's hitting this, it's, it's not taking care of the problem. It's the ladders on the wrong wall. And people would then say, Barry, you're being a stick in the mud over, over this. But at the same time, I, you know, a lot of the technology I was part of the champion and insta you to get the technology so we can do this. Because you got to go back and say, what is, what's stopping a DOS attack, right? The DOS attack is caused by people. It's not caused by packets. It's not caused by machines. You know, it's people operating those, right? Those are the extortionists, right? And so they actually mitigate the attack. These are the sort of things we need to go through and, you know, backtrace, figure out what's happening with it, you're right, push back on the attack, that sort of thing with it, right? And what we do know is when we go after, you know, do the, the backtracing, right? You, we can capture, we can lock people up, right? It takes extra work, it takes effort, it takes collaboration, it takes um, uh, effort with it, Source address validation has a role to play, but it's not like the, the core, you know, stops the DOS attacks, right? Because there are other things out there. So if source address validation isn't going to cause, you know, stop the DOS attacks, we got to be reflective. We got to think of what we're going to do differently than just trying to turn it on everywhere, because that 20% of turning it on is just going to get uh, harder and harder and harder, right? So let's look some of the things with it. Like, so if I'm out there, I'm getting hit with reflection attacks and reflection attacks is coming from source address validation. You know, I got to look at say, what are the sort of things we can actually focus on to help us figure out where and how and what's the most important of turning it on, All right? So number one of the things out there I say is get as many organizations as possible participating with shadow server and pulling down their daily reports. Because the daily reports gives you more of here's how I can secure my network 
right? And here's how I can remediate things like reflectors being used and devices like that. And if you got a, you know, a reflector being used inside your network, cleaning it up actually mitigates, you know, um, or reduces the impact of DOS because you're taking the tools away from the game with it. So you take this, all right? That's, that's a productive thing to put efforts on. Get more and more organizations uh, subscribing to the report and utilizing the report and automating the reports. The other thing that's critical is get people to load up Spoofer, all right? So Spoofer project, and this is one of the things I'll, I'll step out and jump, jump off of this so you can see people. The Spoofer project is the second generation. First generation was a, a DARPA contract to um, a couple of researchers at MIT, and we used to actually measure the effectiveness of rolling out BCP38, or source address validation, right? And it would actually measure with a certain methodology to find out is it going through a NAT, not through a NAT, you know, um, and so we can get numbers behind is it actually working? So. And at the end of that research grant, um, you know, we hit the 80-20 point. And I did a blog saying like, hey, Victory, we're at the 80-20 point. Okay, let's work on the next problem. And then people got mad because they said, no, no, we need to do it everywhere. And I go like, 20%, 20 percent's hard. And to, because the community was upset because I kept on saying the obvious 80-20, 20% hard. And they said, we need to do something. I said, okay, well, we need the measure. And so uh, people got together and then we moved the project over to CADA and it's still at CADA. So on here, everybody here should, as a professional, go to uh, the CADA site and download the spoofer tool. You can load it up on your computer. You can load it up on a Raspberry Pi. You can measure, right? You wanna do it for two reasons. One, to participate, because the more people to participate, the better. And number two, it's a tool to actually police the entropy on your network. Because anytime you apply policy, like if I apply source address validation, what happens is over time, any configuration you put into your network could devolve. Entropy can kick in and it could get misconfigured or during an upgrade cycle, it, that particular line in the code may not be applied or something can happen. And all of a sudden what you thought was a policy that worked now is a policy that doesn't work and you didn't know about it. A tool like Spoofer is one of the tools that you can use to monitor. And then Kata will send you a note and say, hey, you're spoofing again. Oh, I don't want that, right? So it's, it's a free operational tool for that sort of uh, 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 work with that. So, um, and you pick up things like this. This is one of the things, I, I put this slide in here because, um, and this is something they, they listed out as part of the work last year, that they noticed that, you know, a huge, a huge amount of ISPs allow spoof addresses, their own infrastructure addresses that come into their network. And I looked at that and I go like, ah, this is a problem. So this is something I'll, I'll be talking more about tomorrow with point protection, because this is a core principle of putting access, infrastructure access list on the edge. And the number one thing you do is no spoofed addresses. If the IP addresses are allocated to me, I should not see anybody else on the internet sending me a source address of something that's allocated to me. I should do anti-spoof coming in. And what the CADA results is showing is that most organizations don't do that anymore which means their backbone infrastructure is exposed to having spoofed addresses coming in, and then you can ricochet it back and forth inside your network. There's a, there's a, um, there's a threat vector out there called middle boxes. And the middle boxes, you can actually set up where they ricochet that next uh, back and forth. And middle boxes are firewalls, load balancers, um, anti, uh, uh, you know, content filters. They started as a, it was an academic tool that measure can you use uh, the, the uh, censorship tools as a way to do uh, reflective DOS attacks. But then what we found out through uh, some investigation is it, it's much broader than that. So you can take firewall A and firewall B and put, put it into a state where they start ricocheting back and forth in infinite. 
So if I can spoof into an organization and say, here's firewall one, here's firewall two, I spoof into that, point into this, and then they start back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and that's our saturated link. That's where a measuring, measuring something like from the spoofer project, this is where this measuring data can show you where we have a risk. Now you can mitigate that risk easily by going through and put infrastructure access lists and put anti-spoof on the edge of your network, right? What Kate is trying to do with their work is they're trying to get where this is all better default. And they have a paper that they published with it. So, and they have good statistics on it, right? So you can see what you look like and you can actually get more of the spoofer work, spoofing, uh, the spoofer tools into your network to help out. So when you look at this, pop out here, this is the Kata page, right? And when you go to the spoofer project page, right? This is kind of like the details of it, right? And you can download the client software. So here you can download the client software. I have the Mac version on here. And then every time I reboot my Mac, Spoofer pops up. I, I set it up that way. So every time I reboot my Mac, I do a spoof check <laughs> from my device, right? Now, of course, where I sit, you know, on my network, my home network, it's it's okay. But if I go somewhere else on the network, you know, then, you know, that's a good thing to do with it, right? Uh, they have details on it so you can have you got APIs you can talk to now, which is nice because you can go up there and do data requests on APIs. So, so doing other research with it. And then you got the uh, statistics. So you can go like, here's the aggregate statistics of, of the different things they're measuring. But the key thing that you guys would be interested in is here's results by autonomous system, right? So you can get into the autonomous system and say, here's an autonomous system report. Here's blocks. You know, so you can actually see it's all transparent. And this was controversial about, you know, um, when uh, the, the Cata team was saying, do we show this data? We're saying like, yeah, you need to get this data, right? So you can see what the data looks like. And he also got it listed out by country. So you can kind of see, okay, who's, who's got big problems with it, right? So right here, you can say Brazil, India, United States. Those are places that, you know, you have a lot of uh, spoof blocks coming out there. Right, so we can go through and say how how do we go and get those things cleaned up, right? By, you know, and then you can land on a particular country, like you know, spoof percentage, that sort of stuff. Drop in the country. It's kind of kind of cool, you know, where you can do a list out, so you can see what's going on with it. So how you can help with it is again go back over here, download the client, right? And I'll drop the the link in here so everybody can go to the link. For Kata, and you can check it out. And uh, this is one of the things help you know of of taking a different form of action, getting the measurement out there, um, so we can actually see what's happening with um, a source address validation, right? So next, um, what I was been taught about here that the eighty twenty problem, the point of diminishing returns. Right, this is kind of like what we're working on right now. You get to a point where it, it just doesn't uh, matter anymore, right? So the 80-20 problem. So how do we get through the 80-20 problem? Shadow server report, the spoofer project, right? Are, are key things with it. You know, this is kind of reality check with it. Um, we do have organizations that refuse to do source address validation, all right? So when we are starting to run in organizations that refuse to do it, then a bunch of operators got together. So we're gonna we're gonna twist them because when you got these you know these these, these non-compliant SAV organizations they say we're not gonna spend the money because remember source such as validation isn't hard it's just tedious and tedious takes time time is money so if you have somebody who has very limited engineering resources are they gonna spend the money on source Unicast RPF deployment or are they gonna spend the money on like a new service that's going to generate revenue, right? So they're making these sort of choices. So you not need to find a way to attach it to revenue, right? So these are some of the techniques we we come up with, right, over the years, right? Number one is you know put it into policy, right? Put it put it where it's cost effective. Like you put it into an RFP. Do you do source address validation, right? Make it part of the provision and put it in Murphy checks, right? This is some some of the things that we would do out there. Also assume that source address validation is V4, V6. A lot of places have done V4 to say, I got BCP38 deployed, 
but you can also spoof v6, right? And that's one of the things we got to think about these days with the with the growth of v6. It's got to be v4 and v6. Um, make it part of your provisioning because that keeps your cost down. It's part of your provisioning. Put in Murphy checks. Now a Murphy check would be if I'm an ISP, I put a um, a BCP38 on the edge of my network with my customers. And then on my peer inside, I put an egress filter that also has no spoofing allowed. In other words, so I have it in two locations. I have it on the customer edge, which is where most of the packet drops should happen. And then I have a just in case on my peer and edge going out. So I do it on two sides. So if all of a sudden my counters on my peer and edge start climbing up, right? Then I know something broke down below. Right, so you can set it up on both both sides of it. So um, the, net, the last networks I was like in charge of, I set it up on both sides. Set it up on my customer edge. I set it up on my peer and edge. And people would say, "Oh, but what about router performance?" I had no problem with router performance. So routers can handle ACLs like that, right? Um, you know, it's just like my cider blocks on my egress side, right? So. Then you um, measure the impact of the source address validation, right? Um, spoofer project, set up the KPIs, set up login, things like that. And then uh, make sure that all the RFPs have in your vendor performance you put in there. You must be able to do source address, address validation, unicast RPF, and ACLs at the full packet per second rate for all ports. You can, all ports. <laughs> and, you know, because some of the vendors will say, oh yeah, we do all this. We could do it at line rate, uh, but it's a 16 port card. Can you do it on all 16 ports simultaneously? No, 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 we're gonna do it on two ports simultaneously, <laughs> right? So this is where you say, this is what's required. Give me the test data, right? Get your testing boxes, whether it's Ixia or whatever testing tool they wanna do and show me this in the RFP, you know? So, so ask for it, right? Now, yes, the vendor will, whine and complain, but they have to do this anyways in their test labs, right? And this is one of the things that has to be required. Now, all these sort of things you can do, but we needed some, some more levers, some more pressure. So this is where manners came out of. So manners came out of a bunch of operators getting together saying, how can we get more people to do this source address validation, right? It's that 20% problem. How we get more people to do it, right? So Manners is an organization that, you know, um, under ISOC right now, improves the security reliability of the global internet routing system based on collaboration, participation, and shared responsibility. Um, so it's about setting up the norms, right? They work on three key problems, um, BGP prefix filter and hijacking, route leaks, and then spoofing, right? So IP address spoofing. So those, they're not trying to solve everything on the internet, they're focusing on these three areas, right? So they're not working on like DNS issues. That's DNS org, different group works on the DNS resiliency. They're working on these three areas, right? And just to remind everybody, you know, prefix route hijacking is where a misgrant goes out there and hijacks a prefix. This is going on right now with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We're seeing some hijacks going on, intentional hijacks. Right, and we'll go to see how well all the B, the the BGP security mechanisms we've been putting in over the years that Manners is part of promoting, and Apricot's part of promoting, and AP Nick's part of promoting. All these things, we'll we'll see how how well they they work as we get uh, more intensity going on with these things. Route leaks is is similar, but there are mistakes. Right, so a hijack is intentional. A route leak is, whoops, <laughs> I misconfigured the router. <laughs> Sorry, right? So there's the difference between it. Same impact. So sometimes people will attribute, oh, that's a hijack. Um, China hijacked the internet. No, China misconfigured the internet, <laughs> okay? You know, so you, you, you gotta look at the intent and people. They, they point out the same thing, but fortunately route leaks and hijacks you know, the same sort of uh, safety mechanisms we put in the BGP configurations will allow that. And then there's a spoofing, right? So what we're talking about here, 
So what manners turned out to be is where you get ISPs who sign up. So then you as a customer can go to ISP, are you manners compliant? And this sort of numbers, you know, where a bunch of people come together, you can put it in your RFP, it says you will be manners compliant or I'm not gonna buy for you. Don't even, don't even send, you know, I got an RFP out. Question one, are you manners compliant? Are you part of manners? Are you compliant? If not, don't talk to me. Oh, by the way, hey, I just looked at Spoofer, all right? In the Spoofer project, and it shows that you're not manners compliant, all right? So that's what goes into it. There are four programs now. It started with network operators, then exchange points, and now uh, content delivery, edge networks. It's more uh, appropriate to call it edge networks, right? So each of them have like, here's the flavors of compliance of those three major areas over there. So you take like network operators, it's a filtering, anti-spoofing, coordinating, there's supposed to be coordination and communicating with them, and then validation, right? Work with it. And then on exchange points, you know, they have um, incorrect routing information, membership, you know, protect the parent point, you know, those things. So these are the five action areas that they, they worked on the first two of them right now, and they continue to work on the others on compliance. And then for the, um, the edge CDM parts, you see it's the same sort of thing. This is kind of like their, the motions of action as they evolve over, over this, right? So, so this is kind of like the different groups with it. Now, will manners work? Only if you, as uh, an organization who connects to service providers or edge or cloud, requires them to comply. In other words, Manners, as you saw, you know, there are people, there are organizations that you go with a spoofer project and you see that they're not compliant to anti-spoofing. So it's up to you to kind of go to them during your RFP process, revenue, right? And say, are you compliant, right? Um, there's a lot of participants, right? So this is uh, 2021 participants, but the impact of, of working those participants is up to you to actually push you got to push them to actually be compliant, all right? So now it's your turn. Have those conversations with the customers, you know? Um, and, you know, if you're looking for a checklist to have these meaningful security conversations or a manners conversation, just send me a note. Hey, I'm going to talk to my vendor. You pop me a note and then say, here. And then the vendor will be uncomfortable because you ask these meaningful security questions to actually find out whether they're, BS in you or not BS in you, and um, you know based off the experience with it. So we now we're up to some more Q and A part. That's the what we had you know for our source address validation work. And let me stop the share. And looking forward to any more good questions like we had in uh, the last session there. And again, the if you if you do something now, go to go to Decada, download the software, try it out. You know, as as I do it on my Mac, you know, wherever I I fire up my Mac, it starts up, it runs a test, right? Um, right now, from my home, I just have it where I reboot. If I go on the road, if I start traveling again, I set it up where every time I connect to another connection point, coffee shop or conference or things like that, then I look at it. So, um, Etienne asked, looking at Kata, where would I find the manners report? So manners would be, that's a good question there. Um, let me drop in. So manners is a separate site. And what's nice about them too, is they actually, some of these tutorials we're going through right now, they actually have an online training program. So this is the site for manners. And let's uh, share real quick. I'll share the screen here. And um, good digression question. So what they what they did is because we had the spoofer project, we don't try to replicate things. So we got spoofer doing the anti spoofer measurement. Good. All right. And then um, so for manners, what they focused on for telemetry is they created the observatory. And the observatory, what they're looking on that is routing security, like especially the RPKI completeness. 
So what they look for on this one is uh, for their data is remember the first two areas, which is how do you make sure you're you're doing anti anti hijack? Ooh, that's interesting. Way it, um, you know, doing the anti hijack work, right? So, and you can break this down by country and look at the dates and things like that. So this this is what they did with the telescope, where they're supporting the route and uh, stability. So we wanted to look like, for instance. What's going on in the Ukraine? We can look at if there's like, see if this pops up. There's a lag to it. This is not real time. All right. Now, the other one to look at, if you want to look at other stuff for uh, the, the threat of the DOS, is Cyber Green. And Cyber Green is, there's actually the cybergreen.net, right? And then Cyber Green, the statistics. Now, Cyber, Cyber Green, Yuri Ito, this is a, Started out at to, um, you know the JP Cert team with it, and what we needed is we needed to get a simplified view of the global risk for policymakers. But this is valuable to operators too, right? So this shows right now terabits per second capacity. So this is measuring reflector sources from NTP charging open DNS resolvers, SSDP, and SNMP. Notice the NTP. It used to be DNS, but we've been working on D open DNS recursive resolvers as reflectors. Those, those have gone down significantly, but the NTP sources just through the roof, right? And I suspect that a lot of these NTP sources is because nobody's doing anti-spoofing coming into the organization with the access list. So this is something that kind of we're looking at right now. How do we, how do we measure it? How do we look at it? So this is the DOS arsenal, right? This is what they're measuring. And what's interesting about this is, is we can actually go down to, you know, let's select a country. So we can go through and say, let's pick something in, in let's take, uh, where's Indonesia? Where's Indonesia? Because Indonesia, big country right in the middle of Asia, since this is apricot, and we can say, okay. And now this is going to pop up as it propagates what Indonesia looks like from a totality and what Indonesia looks like from an autonomous system standpoint, right? And then, um, and then we'll, you, you can then look at you as an autonomous system, what cyber green is getting off of you, right? So this is, and then you can, and this, it's not designed to be a cleanup tool, but this is kind of one of the things you can do with it. So, oh, we got a log error. So there we go, there's Indonesia. So, so you can get the details of it, right? And then you can go within that particular area, you can actually dig down and say, here's the different autonomous systems that it sees with it, right? So it builds up with it. So, so this is some, another one to check out, right? Because um, it's got outside in data on your network if you're one of these autonomous systems. So that's a good question, Etan. Thank you. Next question. Any other? So in summary, again, with the source address validation, if we go out there and we, we, if we wave a wand and all of a sudden we turn it on everywhere, it's just still not going to solve the DDoS problem. Uh, we, we, the 80-20 problem is a hard problem to get around. That 20% is hard. We can't stop. We got manners which puts RFP pressure. We got put it as part of your processes and we got shadow server to find reflectors. We got cyber green to find reflectors, right? So you got these sort of tools out there that we can use to actually uh, push back against the DDoS capabilities out in the network. And you do this sort of security hygiene to take care of your network. So if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and uh, we can take any other discussion and questions afterwards. I'll stay on for a little while.